Good afternoon, everyone. This is Tanya Williams from the Division of Child Care and Early Childhood Education. Welcome to our February Zoom call. I hope everyone is safe and well out there. I think this past month has probably been um, one of the hardest times for all of us um, since the beginning of the pandemic. And I'm, I'm sure we were all thinking we were past that at this point, but um, I think we're possibly on the other side or getting close to the other side of the, the latest surge. So uh, again, I hope everyone's safe and well, and thank you all for everything you're doing. We've got a pretty packed agenda. The team's gonna be sharing some announcements, but I'll start with a couple. Um, Brenda, if you'll advance to the next slide. <clears throat> um, this information was as of yesterday. I haven't seen an update today, but we had about 27 facilities um, that were closed temporarily due to COVID. Um, the capacity was around 167,478. Um, I just want to, I think I talked about this last month, but I think there's been a great deal of confusion. So I'm just going to run through this. <clears throat> We have on the Division of Child Care and Early Childhood Education's website under important COVID-related information, pandemic guidelines. These are not requirements. So let me just repeat that. They are not requirements. Your program does not have to follow these. What your program is, is required by law to do is follow minimum licensing standards. And anything, your district, your board, your owners, whatever policies you all have in place. So I think it's really important to check with whoever is in charge at your program. If you're in charge, you get to decide what's right for your families and children. Uh, but please note that we haven't had requirements since last spring. Um, we had requirements from about April or May of 2020 until last spring of 21 and those became guidelines again. So they are only suggestions or recommendations, not requirements. We will not cite you in child care licensing for any of the, those guidelines. We will only cite you for not following minimum licensing regulations. Um, so I would encourage you to look at section 1100 in your minimum licensing standards really everything you need is there in terms of safety. If children are positive, that means they have an infectious disease and they should be excluded. If children are running a fever of 101 or more, or if they have other symptoms that are not typical for that child, all of those are covered under minimum licensing regulations. So you certainly can craft whatever you want to. We have no policies around quarantining <clears throat> in our minimum licensing standards. Um, so we are updating the guidelines today. Um, the CDC or Centers for Disease Control had updated guidelines at the first of the year. We have updated ours, but I have gotten something from the Department of Health and I can tell you, if you've been following the updates, we currently have on there as guidance and recommendation only that children four and under, are, it's recommended that they quarantine for 10 days. The reason being the masking, the new guidelines allow after five days if you can wear a mask. The updates we're adding oh, today no does allow for that. So for three and four year olds, it will now allow you, if that's what you want to do, again, you don't have to do any of it if you choose not to, unless you're following your district or whatever your program is telling you to do. But if you have three and four year olds who can wear a mask consistently and comfortably, then you could allow those children back after five days. So that is, I think, the biggest change. We will be putting those up if they're not already there. I know the team will get those changes. We just got those about an hour or two ago from the Department of Health. Again, only guidelines, not requirements. Um, if you need assistance, please contact us or your licensing staff and we will try to assist you with anything related to this. But I just wanna make sure that there's no confusion because I think there certainly has been. So I appreciate everything you all are doing. I do wanna talk, the other thing about minimum licensing standards, if you have an infection, contagious disease, whether it's COVID or something else, 
you are required to notify all of the families in that classroom that there has been a positive case. You don't tell them the child or the family, you just say, we've had a positive exposure either to COVID or measles or whatever else may be going around in your community. Those are promulgated rules that you are required to follow. <clears throat> I have received a few notices about billing and payment. So I just wanna update you all and share some information with you all about that. We were notified last week. So please note that we don't always know when there's a problem. We were notified at one day last week, I believe it was Wednesday morning, that there was a billing payment issue going on. It was not on the child care early childhood side. My division does not have control over everything. It is set up through ACES for the payments. I am not sure exactly what happened. We are still investigating and we've asked for the results of that so that we can know um, and make sure that we avoid that in the future. But I just want you all to know, I really am sorry that happened. We immediately put information up on the billing website for you all to, to notice that there was something happening. But I understand the frustration that must have caused. We can't control everything. If we could, we would never have that happen. So I am very, very sorry that something on the payment side occurred that caused you all to have a delay. My understanding is that has been repaired, whatever it was, we are still trying to find out. We will let you all know as soon as we have that information, we will share that. But I do not know what caused it. I have no idea. It was nothing on my staff. Everything we had showed that we had funding. And so we're still investigating with our IT and our finance folks to find out, but we will let you all know when we have that information. We will always post, so if you're having billing payment issues, look for updates on the billing site. We do try to let folks know when there's going to be a delay, if we're aware of it. If you do have a problem, please don't assume that we know. Contact us. That may, you may be the first person to alert us here in the Division of Child Care because the money is not here in our division. It is over at the Department of Finance Administration. And so everything happens electronically. And so we don't always know when there's a payment issue, but I really do apologize for that. My understanding is it has been repaired and that payments were made over the weekend. If you, for some reason, did not get payment for any billing that you had for childcare, either essential or regular, please uh, feel free to reach out to me or to um, Tom Shepard's team. My understanding is this was not limited to just childcare, that it could be also on the nutrition side. So for any of you that access our child nutrition program, it could have happened in either place, but the payments as I understand it have been made. So I just wanted to make sure you all aware and don't assume that we know about those things. Please contact us and make sure that we are aware so that we can post it and also have somebody investigating what might be causing that problem because we don't want you to have a delay um, on the billing side or payment side. Um, I wanted to just share my staff. I, I looked at the PowerPoint in advance and they don't like to brag apparently about themselves, but I, I said, make, make sure you let the providers know some things. Um, I wanna just say that they have authorized 15,045 essential worker vouchers. So that's 15,045, we have gone over 15,000. I know they're gonna cover some updates about essential workers. I believe they have a couple of hundred that they're processing right now, new applications and they are starting to process. These, a lot of these 15,000 were families that we were serving last year, but I just have to give them a shout out for that hard work um, because it took quite a bit of effort and they had to get additional information as required by the federal government. So I just wanna thank that team for their continued work there. Um, thank you all, continue to be safe. Uh, we ha do have some updates about some things related to COVID as we go through the rest of the presentation. So um, I'll just be monitoring the chat box for questions, but thank you all. And I think Patricia Johnson is up next. Good afternoon. Um, I'm just going to have some really short updates pertaining to the um, waiver request forms that you all are submitting to the CCDF program participant inbox. Um, starting today, we're going to be moving to a five day quarantine. So if you have children that are positive and you want to um, send us the waiver forms, we're going to grant the five day is recommended by the CDC. 
Um, if you have um, additional time or you're requesting additional time, you have to actually submit that and uh, contact us directly and we'll review it with the administrator and get back to you with an email as we have always done in the past. Um, for the, since you do not report the list to the Department of Health, the information is uh, number two, you have to contact Jaleesa Hickman. Um, that form is also on our website and Jaleesa can direct you to that form if you're not already familiar with it. Um, the waiver documentation will still need to be submitted with the supporting documentation. I know someone, some have questions related to um, the um, supporting documentation since there are tests that are done at home. Uh, just get the statement from the parent if they have a picture. I know sometimes we get pictures of positive tests, but to have the parent get the statement done and all that information is listed on our procedure as well. We did update our procedure. I know some of you all got the auto response from our email and it stated the Arkansas Department of Health list. Disregard that we did update that procedure yesterday. Um, March 1st, we'll be moving to the participant agreement information. Um, basically, depending on COVID, of course, you know, this um, pandemic can change at any time. But beginning March 1st, we'll be moving to the requirements and the participant agreement related to absentee billing. Um, you want to refer back to page 11 of your participant agreement, especially when you have like an outbreak in your facility and you're requesting uh, to bill for any type of closures. School districts, you have your AMI days, but we also have a section there for our privately owned facilities of how you can request that time period as well. And I think that's all for me. Do you all have any other questions? Okay. Sorry folks, I'm kind of on mute. Um, so I've seen one question on the changes from for the uh, folks who are, are recommended to go to the 10 day quarantine due to not being able to wear masks. That is new information that we just received. And yes, we will adjust our um, COVID absentees to that 10 days for, um, to follow those guidances. So the next thing that I wanted to discuss is the ARPA stabilization grants. Um, so once again, I, I remind everybody that these are only for, for facilities in operation on or before March the 11th, 2021 that are eligible. And our availability for ARPA grants, right now we have all three uh, grants open, the operational grant, the quality approval grant, and the expansion grant. Uh, Paige will be coming on next and discussing the expansion grant in, in detail and giving you some final numbers uh, as far as the grants are concerned, and I don't know where my why my camera is not working, folks. I'm sorry for that. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to point out, and we've had uh, this situation in, in a couple of a couple of times where a facility has actually received a grant, and my camera is working. I'm told. Okay. <laughs> My, uh, where we actually have facilities receive the expansion grants or receive uh, the ARPA stabilization grants. And then the next month close down uh, their childcare facility. So these grants are for the stabilization of the childcare field. Uh, if a provider closes down within six months of receiving grant funding, that facility, facility will be turned over to the Office of Payment Integrity and Audit for a full review of the grant funds received and how they spent that grant fund. Uh, the providers will be required to provide receipts so that all grant funds are on, um, have been spent for uh, and accounted for for allowable costs. So any facility that's considering closing down, uh, there is a provision where some of that grant funding can be spent on 
uh, pre expenses. However, all of it has to be spent on allowable costs. And so they, those facilities that close down within that six month time will be beginning an OPAI uh, Office of Payment Integrity audit review on their grant fund to be sure that that fund, those grants have been spent on allowable cost. So all other grants uh, will be still under the random review cycle in which there will be a random review of all grants awarded and OPIA will be doing a review on those grants. We did have Office of Payment Integrity and audit scheduled to be on this meeting today, but due to unfortunate uh, circumstances, uh, they had to cancel at the last moment and could not be on uh, this call. They did assure me that they would try to be on the call in March to explain both the review process and the audit requirements for receiving uh, DHS funds and federal funds. So hopefully they will be able to join us next month to go over all of those audit requirements. I do apologize on their behalf that they could not be here today. It was unavoidable, um, but they are planning to be on our call this next month. Can we go to the next slide? And I wanna turn this over to Paige. She is going to talk to you about uh, the use of the expansion grants and give you an update on uh, the numbers for our grants, Paige. Thanks, Tom. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'd like to start by giving the um, good news about how many grant applications have actually been submitted. So far to date, we've received 2,743 grants for a total um, request amount of $119 million, $119 million $27,500, a lot of money. So that's the grants that we have currently um, it, either the in-house somewhere in the system. Now, out of those, we have paid 1,353 um, grants have been paid for a total of $48,017,623. So that's you know, 48 millions that million dollars that have actually gone out into the field from the grants. <clears throat> right now, we have, um, sorry, losing my voice. We have under 186 um, <clears throat> grants that are in house right now to be reviewed for around $10 million. So we appreciate you guys so much for, um, we're glad to see that you are applying for grants. There still are a number of providers who have not started the process. So I would encourage you to um, let your peers know that this funding is available. We are continuing to promote it through um, social media, through our Better Beginnings Buzz. Um, we're making phone calls, but I know that you guys know your uh, peers, so if you just let them know. <clears throat> now, I wanted to talk specifically about the expansion grant because there has been some confusion about that grant. Um, the expansion funds are for providers who want to increase the number of infants, toddlers, and school-agers served. That, that is the purpose, is to try and serve more children. Specifically, we want to serve children in areas where there are, are child care deserts, where there are not opportunities. So what that means is that you should not be applying for these funds if you do not have any intention of serving additional children. And we have seen some applications where that's the case, where people do not want to serve more. So please keep that in mind. It's only to serve ch more children in high quality care, <laughs> in quality care. Um, again, just like Tom said, that in order to be eligible for these funds, you have to have been in operation, just like with the others, on or before March 11th, 2021. Now, let's just say that you do want to serve more children, which we hope 
you do, or it's a, if it's a fit for you. We understand that it's not necessarily a fit for everyone. Um, and, but if this is something where you see that there's a need in your community and um, you have extra space or you see that there's a way that you might be able to um, reorganize your facility, we encourage you to first reach out to your licensing specialist. That would be your first step. Reach out to your licensing specialist and have them come and see your facility, talk through your plans, um, see if it's gonna be, meet the minimum licensing requirements. We do and will require, you will have to upload documentation from your licensing specialist that says that they approve of the plan and how many additional children you can serve. I skipped over, <laughs> skipped over number two, which is also part of the application. We do want you to explain why, why you feel like there's a need uh, and why you want to expand. Um, do you have a waiting list? Are there not other facilities in the area? Um, those are just a couple of examples of, of things that you could use to explain. So just know that this is different than the other applications. We will be wanting more information from you. So you'll need to submit the narrative. Then you'll need to get, get with your licensing specialist. And you also will have to upload your fire inspection. So this, again, this application is for if you want to expand, you will need to upload your plan, explain your plan, upload um, documentation from licensing and your fire inspection. Now, I've had questions about how the funding can be used. I think the easiest thing to explain is what it cannot be used for. This funding is not, and it's because of the federal uh, regulations and guidance, it's not Paige Cox saying this. This is what it says on a federal level. The funding cannot be used for new construction, major renovations, or to purchase a building. You can use it um, for like minor renovations, um, rent, uh, curriculum, resources, uh, furniture, things to set up a classroom. Now I have talked to some people who are, if, if you're wanting to um, do major renovations to expand, you could do that using other funds and then use the expansion dollars to help set up your quality classroom. So um, I'm here to uh, help you um, if you've got any questions and I do appreciate you all reaching out to me. And uh, Nicole Tarkington, who works on our team, is also here to assist you. Um, the expansion grant is a one-time grant. Yes. And so that's why it's so important that you think about, um, before you make this commitment to expand, we are, and part of the expectation is that you'll maintain the new level of um, capacity level for two uh, years. So that's something to think about. Uh, can the expansion grant be used to provide a summer program and facilities? So if that's for after school, um, we can definitely talk about that. Yes. Let's see. In the stabilization grant funding, are we able to shift fundings to the categories that were already budgeted in another category? If you could contact me so I can get some more details and assist you, um, you can move funding around, in, but I'm not 100% following your question, but I'm happy to help. I think that's all of the, let me see. I think I caught all of, okay. I don't suppose this can be used for, used retroactively. We just expanded our center. Um, so contact me about that as well. Um, and, it and it really depends on what you were like, what the, it, it, there are things that we need to discuss. How long do we need to stay open after we receive the grant money? Okay, so I have actually, again, just to reiterate what Tom said 
does. <laughs> this is this funding. We really it's to help um, enhance and stabilize the uh, childcare, and so for the quality improvement dollars, that's to improve the quality of your program now and moving forward for children. So, I mean, we, on all grants, okay. So I'm gonna let Tom answer that, Tom, <laughs> please. I guess I, I'm just even surprised at, at the question because we're trying to stabilize childcare and the funds that we're given uh, should be sufficient to keep a facility open and, and running. These are not funds that they have that you've normally received, so they're additional funds. Um, if you have that particular question, why don't you call me individually and we'll talk about that. Kim, yes, the funds can, I think the funds can be used for that. Um, is it can't be a major remodel. So if you're not removing, uh, moving a load bearing wall, but I, that looks like an expense and you can call me, Kim, I, I know you will. And I'm, I'm sorry I stumbled, but I'm with Tom. I'm, I'm always surprised that people are asking me that question because I've been the one who's discovered that we just, I just, I personally just approved some grant applications, guys for providers who then submitted their closure notice two weeks later. I just get chills. I'm just, you know, so that's why I stumbled on, on that question. So if, if you are already thinking that you're going to close, then maybe you really need to think about whether or not you should be applying for the funding. That's my personal thoughts on that. I'm going to jump in here. I appreciate the comments on that. I see quite a few. There's still some questions out there on some other things, but uh, Mary, thank you so much for clarifying that um, comment. I do think the staff, they have been very um, disturbed by, you know, approving and then sending funds and then finding out a provider's closed. So I appreciate you for clarifying that it could be that some folks are closing nearing retirement. And I appreciate you know, I, I, I would agree with Paige. Here's what I would say for operational funds. Uh, we're we're going to talk about all of them for just a second. But for operational funds, I absolutely think all of you, we accounted for all of you to apply. You should apply, you know, even if you're planning on retirement, that could be some retro things, you know, that have kept you stay or, help, or helping you stay open right now in the moment. That's how I look at the operational, like it is right now. What do you need to help you? So I, I wouldn't worry quite as much. I don't think it's I don't think it's really prudent for us in government when we have almost half a billion dollars for us to say, take the money and then don't have any accountability. So I, I just I want you to know my staff are really, you know, we're not trying to be mean about this. It's about accountability and there will be audits and there will be reconciliation on these items. So for those who are thinking about retirement, you know, if you've done the operations and you've gotten, and maybe it was for paying for things that happened retro during COVID, um, and that's fine. You serve children, that happened. I think that's legitimate. I think the quality improvement, I think we're starting to get into a blurred line. You know, if you know today that you're possibly going to retire, then I would say, I'd be careful about that because the requirement for that is you're trying to improve your facility, which would imply that you're going to continue to operate. And I know there are things that are unforeseeable. So we're not talking about that. Maybe somebody gets a terminal illness. That's an outlier. We're talking about just, I know I'm going to retire today. I would probably caution you to think about that or to really think about how you're going to do that. Maybe it's, the, it's items that you can do because you know you're going to sell it to someone else or somebody else is going to take over and it continues to live on. But the, as Tom and Paige have both explained, this is really about the supply of child care and early childhood education for the state. And so our jobs as public servants is to make sure that not only are we helping stabilize the current field, it's to build for the future. 
So for expansion, if you think you're going to retire, I would not recommend that you write for expansion. The, the opportunity there is really so at the end of this in Arkansas, we can all stand and say we had 1,930 providers before the pandemic or during the pandemic, and then we got to 2,200. So just, just know that this is really about, you know, thoughtfulness to the process. So, and I appreciate all of you who are posting in, you know, we definitely want you all to have the opportunity, but I do think for anyone who's out there on that fence of, I'm thinking, I'm not sure, you know, don't do something um, because I, I don't want, I don't want to be sending letters to folks saying we're going to apply, um, you know, force to this and try to get money back and get collection people involved or to put your name on a list at DHS that says you can never be a part of our programming or funding. And that's exactly potentially what could happen. So if you're thinking about it, I, I agree with Tom, call Tom and talk to him about it. Definitely do the operational. Consider on the quality improvement. If you're wanting to expand and plan to be around for a while for the expansion, do so. But if you're thinking about retirement, definitely don't do the expansion. So I hope that was helpful. Um, and I appreciate, Teresa, I know you kind of started off, kicked us off with that. So thank you so much for weighing in there. Um, I, I want to go back up. I know there are a couple of you, and I've tried to reply to you guys offline individually, but I just want to kind of put this out in the universe. We have some folks asking about, and I want to talk about this because I've gotten pretty involved on some of them um, myself. Families who were essential workers. We had new federal direction and we had to do guidelines on their income. So we had to get their paychecks and we had to certify that their assets did not equal to or exceed a million dollars. When we got that back, what we found is there were quite a few families or a handful of families that were by their check, by the paycheck stubs they sent, eligible for low income childcare. Just because they were eligible by their paycheck stub doesn't mean there weren't. There's a whole other application for that. And we can't use the application for essential for that. So there's some additional documentation that's required. So if your family sent in all of that, and they and I have gotten several from programs where the family has the email that they sent with all of their, their documentation, we have an email box that once it is filled up, it will not take any other information. So I'm saying this to you, it's possible that if they did send it, that it got kicked out and we didn't get it. That did happen with some of our families around, I think, November. So if it happened, they should have their email. And I've talked to several parents, myself personally, and advise them, hey, just send your email with all that documentation that you've already sent. We'll know that you sent it back in September, October, and we'll process those. We're not trying not to help you with your low income families. We just have to get the complete packet of information that's required for low income because we are subject to federal audits and federal requirements and we are in an improper payment process right now and we will be monitored this spring in May. So we're just preparing for that and trying to make sure that we have all the documentation we need so that we aren't caught on a fence of someone saying you paid this provider this money for this family that you did not determine eligibility on. The requirements are a little bit different. So I know that's frustrating probably, but for any of you who have families that were essential, but then because of their paycheck information, potentially are low income, please send that information to Tom or Brandy, and we will try to work with you to get all of those families determined. We might be missing information. And I think that sometimes families that have not participated are not familiar with the communication or it's confusing. And so I, I personally have worked with some families myself and I do realize that it's very concerning for them. So I appreciate all of that work on that, but just wanted to answer that for some of you who have families that are in this transition. We want to serve them. We have the funding on low income to serve them. Um, if we can get all the documentation and we can get them keyed as quickly as possible. So just work with your staff. I do see some, and I will just let you guys know, I mentioned this in January. We too have been hit by COVID. 
I had a positive case this morning in the building. I had one yesterday. I had probably 10 or 15 last week. So please know that, yes, we are hit. And so if they're reaching out to a caseworker, it is possible, probable that they are out. So if you will try to direct that to Tom and Brandy, we'll try to get everything back online. Um, I think we're in a good place with numbers right now on what we're processing. So we only have a couple of hundred essential worker applications in the pipeline, which is a lot lower than 1400 that we were trying to redetermine a few months ago. So, um, you know, just work with us and we'll try to get those families redetermined. On your essential workers that were not redetermined, it's possible that they did not submit the paycheck step or the attestation or check that box on their application about the $1 million assets and we cannot approve them without that information. Um, we will set ourselves up here at the state for audit findings, and, and I'm not willing to do that. So just know that, again, if they sent something and it got caught up in the email box and was not accepted, if you can send that to us, if you have it or if they have it in their emails, I have things that I send all the time and I keep them so that I can resend them. So if they have all that, maybe they can just hit the e resend on that email or forward to us and we can get them all redetermined. So I hope that helps a couple of you that I think are concerned about that. Um, I'm going to go back. Brenda, I don't know if there's anything else on the list of things. All right, we'll get back on track here and uh, we'll go to Kelly Hilburn. There we go, it didn't want me to unmute myself. Okay, just a reminder everyone, I think we've said this several times, but we do have a deadline coming up and it'll be here before you know it for, if you are a CCDF participant accepting vouchers at your facility, you must be level two of Better Beginnings by the end of June of this year. If you have not applied and we have over 200 facilities that have not submitted their application yet. So if you have not applied, we do need those applications quickly because the application process takes a while. You have to do your ERS reviews and everything. Um, that's a process that may take a while. So please get those applications in as soon as you can. And if you have any questions, give us a call. My information is there on the screen, my email. So shoot me an email or give me a call. While we're transitioning from Kelly to the next slide, I think that might be um, regulatory check. Um, now it's Brandy who might really start to answer some questions that you have. So I'll let Brandy, I, I do wanna, she's gonna announce something about essential workers and I've seen a few questions about that. So Brandy, I'll let you take it away. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, some things I'll repeat and just kind of go into a little bit more detail on those. Wanted to let you all know that we have begun, or we have closed out all of the cases who were essential workers and they did not submit a redetermination or we did not receive their redetermination. So those cases are closed. However, we are still currently allowing them to resubmit that information when they find that they did not submit it or we did not receive it for whatever reason. So if you have families that find themselves in that situation, please send those. You can send those directly to me so that we can avoid them being just uh, lumped into the mailbox. And this is in regard to the redeterminations for people who were already on the program. So if you have families who tell you that, yes, I submitted my redetermination, you see that their cases are closed. If it is closed, that means that we did not receive their redetermination. They can send out that information to me and we will get them taken care of. Now, we do have about a little over 200 essential worker applications that we have begun processing. So those are the ones that you are sending to just the essential worker box, not the essential worker redetermination box. 
So these are your brand new people who have never had care before. We are processing those applications. And um, if you have people who, are, who need that, then have them continue to sit, submit their information to that essential worker redetermination, uh, essential worker mailbox. If you find at any time that that mailbox is full, they can submit that application directly to me as well. Want to let you know that you're going to begin seeing authorizations in your, um, in your box, and it's going to say that they are now extended to June 30th. All the new applications that we process, this 200 we're working through now, those will be processed to June 30th. We will extend that to all the people who have the redeterminations as well. So you'll, you're going to see it in kind of a wave. You'll see it first with your new folks that are coming on the program. And then before April, which is when your redeterminations end, you'll start to see those authorizations extend out to June 30th. So right now, essential worker is set to end for all applicants June 30th of 2022, okay? And I do want to really stress this last bullet point to everyone. If you have essential workers in your facility and they do not have a current authorization, they should be making childcare payments to you, okay? So um, as you noted, there are several situations. People will say that they turned it in. We didn't receive it for whatever reason. I don't want anyone to get far down the road and someone has not done their part or we didn't receive it. And then you have to go back and wait months and months till you get your payment. So if there is anyone who does not currently have an, an um, authorization for childcare, they should be making payments to you. I also want to let you know on the um, essential worker applications that we're beginning to process now, some of them were submitted a couple of months ago. We will be starting those applications. You will notice that they start January 1st. I'm hoping that everyone took heed to what we've said in previous meetings, that anyone who did not have a current authorization, that they were receiving payments from those families because all new authorizations will begin January 1st. You can reach out to me if you have any questions or concerns on that start date for your family. Thank you. Okay, to recap, for those of you asking questions about essential worker families, Brandy has announced to you June 30th is the timeline. You know, we're trying to stay on top of this for you all to let you know, and I said we would report on that monthly and be notifying families as we get to the near. But with the funding that we have, we know that we can extend everyone and add these new families through uh, June 30th. So we will continue to monitor. Um, I, I really cannot make a prediction. Uh, you know, I, it might go a little bit longer, but it, it part of it is because we are continuing to add. So just understand when we add, it's not just the adding an, one person, it's the projection of the time that we add them that shows that the money is utilized. So it, it's a, a very, and you've got families with infants and toddlers and that take up more money because we pay a higher rate for that, different levels of quality. So there's so many factors, but um, we will extend it and we will keep extending it for as long as the funds will go. But we do know that we can extend everyone and add these new families through June 30th. So that is uh, where we are with essential workers. I saw a question about low income. We have adequate, uh, our, our funding for low income families, we had an increase a couple of years ago. That fund was increased. And so we do have low income funding. Um, so if you have families, yes, there have been waiting lists in the past, but we have not had a waiting list really since before the pandemic. Um, but, and we will again not announce that on this call or we will let you all know as I put it on the billing site, if at any point that has to happen. But at this time, that is not an issue, nor do we foresee it as an issue in the future. Um, but part of that depends on how many families apply. So if you do have low income families in your community or families that you think would be eligible, please encourage them um, to apply for low income childcare. We do have plenty of funding for that. 
Um, I see a question uh, from Rita Neve. Um, you know, Rita, we have always announced and we stand by that. If you have families that are in state funded pre-K, if you run a part year program or a school year program, um, such as Head Start ABC for any of those eligible families, we will um, serve those families. So yes, um, just work with my team and, and we will assist with getting those families for the summer if your program is gonna be open. So yes, ma'am. Um, I think most of the questions have been answered. I'm gonna go back through gang and I'm gonna let Brenda go. Brenda, if there's the next slide, you can go ahead and put that up. Good afternoon, everyone. While Ms. Tanya Williams is going through the chat, and we just want to remind everyone that our next background check training is going to be Thursday, February 24th from 12 to 1. And I will be sure to put a link to our website where you can find that training as well as past recordings. And I will also be sure to put my contact information. So if you have any questions regarding background checks, please feel free to reach out. We're here to help. Thanks, Kayla. I did see a question that was up in the chat box about if you're at level three and four and through six for level four through six, I would encourage you if you're a level three program and you're writing for the quality improvement grant to use the environmental writing scale data. It's incredible and we use it a lot here to look across at all the programs. But if you're looking to improve your program and you're not sure what to do, don't worry about level four through six, it's driven by that. So be looking at what's in the environmental writing scale, how you scored, and is there anything in that that you could do better? Um, so if, if you're struggling with that, maybe you scored really high everywhere, um, please reach out to us. We're happy to talk through, um, this might be a time to try to take care of some wish list items that would help with your, maybe some training on curriculum or assessment, um, but, I just wanted to kind of throw that out. There is something in place for you all to utilize to help plan the quality improvement grant. We are working on that promulgation, uh, Dr. Wolf, for levels four through six, and we will be pushing that out for everyone to see um, as we work through that. But um, I would, I just don't want you guys to get caught up in what that says because it's not promulgated. I would really use the environmental writing scale. So thank you. That was a great question. I did see. And I do want to kind of walk through because there's been a lot on this call. A lot of change is occurring and we're really in a bit of a transition with COVID everywhere. If you aren't feeling it out in the world and it feels kind of strange to say that today when we've all just experienced this incredible surge. So we're trying to ease into it, guys. We're trying not to just go everything's out now. So just know that we're trying to slowly ease into the next transition and we're learning things as we go along. So I, the, the updates for the updated guidance is not on our website yet. I just got it from the health department right before this call. It should go up today. I know that uh, Becky Mitchell on our team was working on it. There was a phone number change that needed to be made because we wanna make sure that they know who to call and that's Julissa. Um, or that number that's going to be on there. So, um, because we still have some reporting on the federal funding side that we have to ensure is in place. So just know that that should be posted today, probably after this call, if it doesn't get posted before we're finished. Um, I kind of want to walk through, if you have a child who is positive, they are required by licensing regulation to be excluded from care. You do not have to close that classroom. So that's why there are things that are going to be changing. That's why we're talking about the quarantine. We don't have any policy on quarantining currently. That is a choice you get to make. All you're required to do is notify all of the families that you've had a positive case if their child is in that classroom or if you want to notice in the facility we've had a positive case, then families have the option to say, I think I'm gonna hold my child out. You as a provider working with your school district, if you're in a school district or your board, if you 
follow a 501c3 and have a board. Each of you has unique different policies and procedures in place that is guided by whoever runs your program and that's different. Your funding source, if you're in Head Start or ABC, may have different guidelines. We just have guidelines up that follow CDC as a guideline that you may or may choose not to use. You are required to follow licensing regulations, but if you are quarantining children, you are not required to do so unless they have COVID and need to be excluded from care. And I know that's a big change from where we've been because we've quarant been quarantining many times people who were exposed, but I I'm, I'm just letting you all know, you don't have to do that. If you decide you want to do a 10 day quarantine, um, we will look at that. I believe we're working through this month to try to keep, we're, we're switching the policy to the five days. Um, we'll work with you this month. If it's, it, I think Tom has said, if it's 10 days for children under four, we will continue to do that through March 1, but we're planning by March 1 that really the only children that should be out are children who are positive, our staff who are positive. You wouldn't have to quarantine anybody else. And so we can keep you guys updated as we go through that on the March call, but that is our current plan that, you know, quarantines are really about it. If you look at the new guidance, there's quarantining and isolation. So we're not requiring anything except if a child is positive or you have a staff member who is positive, that they be excluded. That's a licensing requirement because they have an infectious disease. You are required to notify the families, but you're not required to quarantine all the other children in that classroom. There is nothing in state law that requires you to do that. That is up to you and your folks who run your organization. And so I just encourage you guys to work with your building, whoever's in charge, who's ever responsible, your administration folks to determine because you may want to adjust your policies. You know, as again, we are transitioning here at DHS, ours changed yesterday. We had some big changes. We we're following the five days. So a, a lot of organizations are making adjustments. So it's, it's up to you all, but just know that as we go forward, we will have to make decisions about payment and those payments probably will become more reflective of what is, you know, five day quarantine. We will work with you though, if you have an outlier situation, because I can think of many where a child or, or something might happen, we will work with your program. That is already in the participant agreement. Forget about COVID. We already have policies. And if you read your participant agreement, there's always been something in there about absentee and unique situations. And we, we, we dealt with those long before COVID. So we will just work with your program individually. But we are, um, I think Tom and them have posted everything in the website. We will, you know, honor the 10 days. But as we get closer to March and as we transition out of the pandemic into whatever the new world is going to look like because we will have COVID in the new world. It's not going away, it'll be like the flu. It'll just be something that exists out there and some people are gonna get it and some people are still going to get really bad sick and some people may die from it. It's not going away, but the way in which we all respond and adjust to it is going to change. So um, that probably has created more questions, but I'm gonna go back. Kayla, thanks for posting your information. I would encourage you all, if you're in a program, to sit down with your leadership and your parents to make good policy decisions about what works in your community. Because I could tell you what I would do, but that might not work in one part of the state or another. I think you all have to decide in your community. Um, some of you may serve families that are in the healthcare profession, for example, they need to be at work. If I get sick, I want to be able to go to the hospital if I need care. And so you have to think about those things. So, you know, you may have people in the food supply chain. I mean, we have essential people and quarantining their children just because one child got, I mean, we could probably test all the children in the state today. And you've probably got children in your care today that are positive for COVID. We could probably run through the office here and test everybody. And there's probably somebody here who doesn't even know they're positive. So just know that, you know, I think you all 
care for the children really well and they need to be in that setting. The disruptions and what's happened over the past two, three years almost now has been very traumatic for all of us. And I think it's it will be great for children to be in the setting with their peers rather than going back home and being quarantined yet again when their family's trying to work and do a hundred other things under a great deal of stress, or maybe they're gonna lose their job. So just think about that as you're making those decisions and work with your leadership and your um, team and your families to figure out the best way to navigate through that and healthcare professionals maybe in your community. I think I'm going to look at the, uh, chat box and make sure there's not anything else so it might get quiet for just a moment and I, my team if you see something in that you can respond to feel free we want to do that we've got a couple more minutes that's that's a great one Amber that really is is your choice at your facility I would really encourage you guys to have written policies so that you notify your families of what your policies are um, so, you know, I, I think that's a good one to think about. I think here at DHS, if we have a positive in the household, a lot of it depends on, you know, whether, whether the individual is vaccinated or not as to what the next step is, but that's something that your program can determine, you know, if they've been exposed to a positive, whether or not we don't have anything about quarantining in our policy, but the new guidelines will be up and you could certainly take a look at those and see if you could put some of that in the language that might work for you, but you are not required to quarantine that child. As long as that child has no symptoms, if their fever is 101 or more, or if they are acting normal and don't seem, are asymptomatic, you are not required to quarantine them. So thanks Katrina for that question. I, I don't know if you heard Tom, um, you all are gonna be announcing the next grant. So the grants that we have in place today are for programs that were licensed on or before March 11th. And I think Tom announced in, during his part that the capacity building or supply building for brand new programs will be released in February, Katrina. So for any of you out there that are brand new, um, be watching for that. Uh, it'll be before the March meeting, but we certainly can update you at the March meeting. Um, but that will be for any facilities licensed after March 11th. So for those of you in that situation, be watching, or if you have colleagues or friends that are planning to. Um, for children four and under, they are they are not required by the Division of Child Care and Early Childhood Education to quarantine. Uh, you will want to check with your funding source or whatever policy you have, but the Division of Child Care does not have anything in place. We do have a recommendation um, that, that currently is on our website that says for children under four, we recommend a 10 day quarantine because we're worried about masking, but we're updating that in a few minutes and it's going to say three and four year olds, if they can wear a mask, could only quarantine for five days. Remember, this is just suggestions or recommendations. You're not required by the Division of Child Care. If you are funded through ABC or Head Start or some other entity, um, or if you work for a district who may have their own set of policies, um, you will wanna check with your leadership about how you're going to handle that. Okay, good question, Mary Beth. We are posting the new guidance uh, right now, you can go to the Centers for Disease Control. We have taken the guidance that they released, I believe, yesterday or maybe last Friday for child care, early childhood, and with working with the Department of Ed, and we're going to put up new guidance. It is only guidance. Um, so please be watching. It'll go up sometime in the next couple of hours if it's not already up there. Um, Mary, for a positive child, they need to be excluded from care until they are symptom free, which may, yes, absolutely, Mary, it could be different. You could have a child that has a fever today and they don't have a fever tomorrow. Just follow your minimum licensing on that because there's a period of time that you want to account for um, within that fever. But if they are coughing or have other symptoms, um, you'll want to make sure that those symptoms are improving or completely gone before you allow them. So you could have some children that only quarantine 
for up to five days. I mean, they may be well within a five day period. If they're three and four and can wear a mask under the new guidance, you are not required to follow that. Uh, but you definitely are going to have different um, situations occurring with children, as we all know. They are all individual and they all respond differently. So, yeah, I understand this is confusing. We are not requiring any quarantining. So just to be clear, we are not requiring any quarantining. That is a choice you get to make. Um, what you will see in the guidance that is going to be posted today is a recommendation that for somebody who has COVID, a staff member, for example, after five days, they may return to work with a mask. Children three and above may also return after five days as long as they are symptom free or improving if they can wear a mask. But those are guidelines. Okay, gang, I think we, that takes us right up to one o'clock. If I've missed anybody, my phone number is 320-8953, and I'll put it in the chat box. If you have a question, please feel free to reach out to me, 501-320-8953, and I am putting it in the chat box. So um, stay safe. Reach out to us if you have a question and we will see you. Our next call is March 1st and hopefully we'll have warmer weather um, and we'll be closer to spring gang and closer to maybe being out of this pandemic even more. So be safe. If you have a question, reach out to us. Um, we'll see you next time. Thank you.